able to join us for the inaugural session of the year. And we are honored to host Dr. Juliet Daniel from McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. So before really I give an overview of the seminar today and introduce our speaker, I just wanted to share some of the reasoning behind our organization and why we started this series. So our organization is all about advocating and amplifying Black immunologists through different events. And with this series, we specifically wanted to explore advocacy in STEM by creating a space that really facilitated a collective approach to the challenges, to the best practices, and to the history of advocacy in STEM. So our aim really is to hold uh, two to three more seminars throughout the year. So please keep an eye out for that. So for today, our seminar, it's gonna be broken up into two parts. So they both will be 30 minutes each. So for the first 30 minutes of the event, Dr. Daniel uh, will share her background and her advocacy journey. And in the last 30 minutes, there'll be a session where you, the audience members, will have an opportunity to ask Dr. Daniel some questions. But really our main goal is to create a discussion with Dr. Daniels and her work and advocacy. So during the first, presentation, please feel free to write down any questions or thoughts or anything about today's seminar so that we can hear more from her in really an informal discussion. And I'll give more information regarding the second part of the event and really how to enter into the session room on the Hopin platform after the presentation. But most importantly, um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Julia Daniel. So Dr. Daniel is a cancer biologist and the Associate Dean of Research and External Relations in the Faculty of Science at McMaster University. So she received her Bachelor's of Science from Queen's University and her PhD from the University of British Columbia. And she completed her postdoctoral studies at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital and Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. So Dr. Daniel's work in cancer biology led to the discovery and the naming of a new gene called queso, which is coined after her favorite Caribbean music, Calypso. At McMaster University, her research team is focused on elucidating the role of queso in cancer and vertebrate development. And her team is also currently elucidating the molecular slash genetic causes for the disparities in incidence and the poor outcomes of triple negative breast cancer in black women. In addition, Professor Daniel co-founded the African Caribbean Faculty Association of McMaster in 2010 and serves on the President's Advisory Committee for Building an Inclusive Community at McMaster. Professor Daniels also serves as a faculty member for student members of women in science and engineering and black aspiring physicians at McMaster. And in recognition of her research and her community service, Professor Daniel has received um, several awards. So including the inaugural Canadian Cancer Society Inclusion Excellence Award and honorary doctor of science from the University of West Indies, UWI Cape Hill, a UWI Vice Chancellor's Award, a WXN Canada's Most Powerful Women Top 100 Award, a 100 Accomplished Black Canadian a Women Award, and a Barbados National Honor Gold Crown of Merit, among many other awards and recognitions. And she has also been featured in Millennium Minds, 100 Black Canadians, and Who's Who in Black Canada. And with that, we're extremely honored to have you today. And thank you once again, Dr. Daniels, for joining us. Thank you, Dominique. I thought we sent you my abbreviated bio. <laughs> I'm expecting you to read all of that. Okay. You have to highlight all of the things that you've done. So, yep, okay. no, we're in the present. Okay. So, thank you so much for inviting me to be your inaugural speaker for this series. So, I get to be the guinea pig. Hopefully, there are no technical issues and stuff like that. I'm going to try to share now. We had issues before. So, let's see. Um, so, thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Um, before I begin my talk and my presentation, I'd just like to give a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking from the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations. I'm within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, and I'm in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give a little 
story about my journey from Barbados to where I am today. And um, I was always fascinated with the human body and the natural world. I was one of those kids that asked lots and lots of wild, why questions. And this was before Wikipedia and the internet. So my source of information was a, a series of books known as the Encyclopedia Britannica, for those of you over 50 years old. And I was really good at math and physics, but unfortunately, because of gender perceptions back then, and still now in some cases, no one ever encouraged me to become an engineer. They all suggested I go into medicine, even though at the time I wasn't taking biology. However, I knew that I always wanted to do research with global impact. And I came from a low income family. So that was a very big dream for someone from where I was coming from. Next slide, please. Um, however, my parents and my whole neighborhood saw that I was a unicorn in my neighborhood compared to many of the other kids. I was a bookworm. I always had my head in a book and, and reading the world, looking at the world atlas as well, looking at places I wanted to travel when I grew up. And so my family saved. And when the time came for me to pursue post-secondary education, they had saved enough to pay for first year of university um, in North America if I decided I wanted to go. And I decided, yes, I wanted to try, even though Barbados had a university. I wanted to explore the world, um, even though it was going to be my first time leaving home as well. So I applied to various universities in Canada. And ultimately, we, choose Queen, we chose Queen's University for the simple reason that they were the only university of the five that I applied to that even treated me as a human before I got to Canada. Upon applying and before being given a formal offer of acceptance, every two weeks they would send me an envelope with a map of Canada, a map of Kingston, a map of Ontario, a newsletter from Queen's University, a newspaper from Kingston, anything to help me feel like I um, would be welcome and accepted at Queen's and also to help orient me to Kingston and Ontario because I would be an international student and we definitely did not have the money for me to go and visit all the universities before I chose one. So that's how I ended up at Queen's University. Next slide, please. So I had a wonderful time at Queen's. Um, as I said, it was my first time away from home. I saw the entire um, undergrad experience as an adventure. I was scared obviously at times, but it was an adventure. However, in the um, first semester of my last year at Queen's, there was a series of unfortunate events that basically led me to become a cancer researcher. The first event was my neighbor in Barbados succumbed and passed away to breast cancer. A month after her death, my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And that same semester, one of the teacher profs at Queens, Dr. Lita Raptis, came to class all excited about the discovery of this new type of gene called oncogenes which we all have, but however, when mutated, seem to cause tumors in, in animal models. And it's, most of those original oncogenes were identified using the chicken as a model. And the chickens were forming tumors when these genes were mutated. Um, so if you just click on the slide, it'll just advance to an, an animation on this slide. So, um, so all of these things were happening. And then, um, as I said, my mom was diagnosed in October, November. Um, of 1986. And then unfortunately, six months later in May of 1987, five days before my convocation from Queens, my mom actually succumbed and passed um, from ovarian cancer. So all of these things pretty much, I hadn't decided actually what I wanted to study after my undergrad. I'd applied to grad school and to medical school because my family wanted me to. And, um, but I did know that I was tired of all the snow and the cold in Ontario. So I got accepted to UBC, which was the warmest part in the warmest city in Canada, Vancouver. And I, after going home for my mom's funeral and spending the summer at home, I moved to Vancouver to start grad school at UBC. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. So I did, um, I did my PhD at UBC doing basic, what we would call basic or fundamental cancer research. And upon completion of my um, PhD, I knew that I wanted to do now that more applied um, research, working with human tissues to really delve deeper into cancer research because the work I had done for my PhD was quite fundamental. Um, because I had learned a lot during my PhD about cancer and the various hallmarks of cancer, I was most fascinated by this one particular hallmark, the activation of in 
invasion and metastasis, which is the process where the tumor cells break off of the primary tumor, whether it be the breast or the prostate or the pancreas, and spread to vital organs such as the lungs, liver, and brain, or brain, because it's though it's that spread, that metastatic spread to vital organs that actually causes patients to die. And so I applied for postdoctoral opportunities across the world, and I did the very adult thing and chose Memphis, Tennessee. Next, if you click, it'll pull up a slide there. Yeah. And I had offers in London, England, San Francisco, California, and I really, really wanted to go to either of those two cities. But um, the labs that I had interviewed in at, those, at both of those um, sites were studying one of the first oncogenes that had been discovered, the RAS oncogene. And there were hundreds of people studying the RAS oncogene globally. And I knew that that would be almost an uphill battle trying to make some discoveries in a field that was already filled with lots of researchers. So I chose Memphis, Tennessee to work with Dr. Al Reynolds at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital because he was working on a protein that he himself discovered as a postdoc and which no one else in the world was studying. And so I reasoned that that would be a unique opportunity to make a significant discovery. Next slide, please. So Memphis was my first introduction, like for I just, yeah, not introduction. I knew about racism, but it was my first overt and really um, traumatic experience of racism was when I got to Tennessee. Of course, my family, no one wanted me to go to Tennessee, actually, when I was looking at all of these postdoctoral positions. But as I said, I made the decision to go to Al's lab just because of the opportunity for the research rather than the actual location. And within my first two weeks there, I was unable to open a bank account to get a driver's license or to get my social security number. And I, it was this circle that I just couldn't break. And eventually my supervisor said, you know, just go back to the bank. That should be the weakest link and try to get a bank account. And because once I had the bank account, then the uh, licensing authority could use that to give me the license, et cetera. And I went to the bank account, to the bank, and sure enough, you know, literally, I, I started crying and said, listen, I don't want to rob your bank. I just want to deposit some money. And um, and she said, calm down. OK, let's start over again. Why are you moving to Memphis? You know, and I said, well, I'm going to be working at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, to which she replied, oh, well, what are you going to do there? And I said, well, I'm a cancer researcher. I'm going to be doing cancer research. And her whole demeanor changed and suddenly I got the red carpet treatment. And I was I was flabbergasted because in Canada, we would never treat anyone the, the way that I was treated just to even open a bank account. So that was like a real rude awakening for me. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I went to Al's lab because he was studying this um, complex, the cadherin catenin cell adhesion complex which is the key complex that keeps all the epithelial cells in, in mammalian tissues um, together. That's what keeps our skin, our intestines, all of our, our organs are coated with this layer of cells called the epithelial cell layer. And they're stuck together by this complex made up of proteins known as cadherins and catenins. And Al had discovered this protein P120 catenin highlighted here in green during his postdoctoral um, fellowship. And what we, what we knew when I joined his lab and what many others knew as well is that in 50% of human metastatic tumors that have spread to vital organs, this complex has malfunctioned and is not working. And so I joined his lab, as I said, specifically because I wanted to focus on this particular hallmark of cancer. Next slide. And so my project in his lab was to determine the role of this new protein he had cloned, P120. What is the role of P120? in cell adhesion and human cancers. Next slide, please. So during the course of my studies with Al, um, I conducted an experiment known as the used to hybrid assay to identify proteins that associated or interacted with P120 in the hopes that identification of such proteins would then give us an understanding of what, what protein, what P120 was doing. We were of course hoping that we would identify proteins that were well known, well characterized, and that we would be you know, off and running immediately. Of course, that was not the case. No low hanging fruits in my story at that point. We pretty much identified a gene that had never been cloned before. Al gave me permission to name it anything I wanted. And because at this point I had realized there were very few black people in science and definitely very few black Caribbean people in science, 
I wanted to give the gene a name that was uh, owed to my Caribbean heritage. And so I named it Kaiso after my favorite Calypso music and the kind of music that we play here in Canada um, during Caravana or in Barbados during crop over or in Trinidad during um, Carnival. Next slide, please. So what is Kaiso? It's actually a transcription factor that regulates the expression of many other genes. It's a dual specificity transcription factor and meaning that it binds DNA by two sites and it regulates various biological processes, including cell proliferation, apoptosis, cell motility, inflammation, et cetera. And it plays a role in multiple cancers. Next slide. So I spent quite a number of years, the first, I would say the first eight years or so at McMaster characterizing Kaizo at a fundamental level. What does it do as a transcription factor? What genes does it regulate? What, um, um, what biological processes is it really impacting? And I went to a conference in um, an American Association for Cancer Research conference in 20, 2008. And at that conference, next slide, please. Um, I heard Dr. Lisa Newman speak about a breast cancer subtype known as triple negative breast cancer. And she was talking about the fact that this breast cancer subtype was most prevalent in young black women, especially young black premenopausal women. And in West Africa, the incidence of this subtype was as high as 50%. And I remember thinking, I'd never heard of this subtype. I'd never heard of a cancer subtype that was disproportionately affecting black people, far less black women. And being from the Caribbean, I had already been thinking about retirement and retiring somewhere warm and sunny. And so I thought that, you know, I will start investigating this and looking to see whether or not this phenomenon was also occurring in the Caribbean. And um, I could be in the Caribbean in the winter doing research and then back here in the summer um, to avoid the cold. Next slide, please. So what is triple negative breast cancer? As the name suggests, this subtype of breast cancer is negative for the expression of three biomarkers that are typically used to diagnose and subclassify all breast cancers. So those biomarkers are the estrogen receptor um, biomarker, the progesterone receptor, and the HER2 receptor, ER, PR, and HER2. And the current drugs to treat breast cancer target the expression of any of those three biomarkers on the breast tumor. Unfortunately, triple negative breast tumors do not express any of those biomarkers and therefore none of the current drugs for breast cancer, tamoxifen or Herceptin can be used to treat triple negative breast cancer patients. Unfortunately, it's highly prevalent in young black and Latino women compared to white women. And while socioeconomic status may explain the poor health and disease outcomes of triple negative breast cancer in black women due to low access to uh, poor or limited access to healthcare, it doesn't fully explain the high incidence in black women. The World Health Organization has indicated that breast cancer is an emerging health crisis in Africa with a five-year survival rate less than 50% compared to the current 90% survival rate that we see in North America. Next slide. So this graph um, um, shows you it's some interesting data and um, the graph on the left, if you focus on the graph looking at incidence, you'll see in green the incidence of breast cancer in Caucasian women and you'll see that historically the incidence of breast cancer has been highest in Caucasian women compared to other women of other ethnicities. Underneath that line, the indigo or blue line is the incidence in black women. And you'll see again that that's also lower than it is in white women, but it started to approach similar incidence in the early 2000s, possibly in part because of more awareness, better in detection, rather, and, and possibly just genuinely um, greater incidence for other reasons. If we look at the graph on the right, what's really noticeable is how those colors have flipped. So on the left, we had higher incidence of breast cancer in white women. However, on the in the right graph, you'll notice that the mortality rate the death rate from breast cancer in white women is significantly lower than it is in black women. And this drop, this precipitous drop that you see in the mortality rates for breast cancer in white women correlates and coincides with the introduction of those drugs I just mentioned, tamoxifen and Herceptin, which target the estrogen receptor and the HER2 receptor. And because white women tend to have breast cancers where their tumors express ER or HER2, 
Those drugs work effectively. Consequently, there was a drop in their mortality rate. However, in black women, we're, because we tend to have a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer, the um, mortality rates actually went up for a bit and now they're steadily declining, but there's still a significant gap in the mortality rate between black women and all other women. Next slide, please. This is a, um, a nice um, chart that summarizes that the, the, the shows statistically as well how this is quite different among black women compared to other races. So just focus on the, um, the five bars to the very right of this graph where I've got the green arrow. Um, so you'll notice that in black women, in this case, black women is in red and um, Caucasian women are in blue. And you'll notice that the rate per 100,000 women is 38 black women per 100,000 versus 19 for Caucasian women and for all other ethnicities for, in this case. So it's literally twice as high the incidence in black women compared to all other ethnic races. And again, because there are no specific therapies, this is leading to that, we speculate this is leading to that high mortality rate. And currently we're all trying to determine how much, uh, what contribution does socioeconomic status play in this process, as well as genetic predisposition. Next slide, please. So in 2012, um, so in 2011, as I said, I went to the conference in 2008, learned about triple negative breast cancer, started doing a little bit of gradual research on this. And then in 2011, I went to Barbados and, start, and did a research leave there for three months where I started collaborating with physicians and scientists in Barbados to look at the incidence of triple negative breast cancer in Barbados. We were also um, at the same time doing molecular cell biology studies to see whether or not Kaizo was differentially expressed in breast tumors. And this was this, a lot of this work was done by a very talented graduate student, Blessing Basi Archibong, um, indicated here in the stack figure, in the slide, sorry. And um, this graph on the left is showing the incidence, or the sorry, the expression of Kaizo correlated with the overall survival of any woman diagnosed with breast cancer. And I hope you can see from this diagram that in red, where we have high levels of Kaizo expression, women diagnosed, sorry, women with very high Kaizo levels have the worst prognosis or worst overall survival compared to women expressing low levels of Kaizo. So based on this and other data we had generated in collaboration with a colleague in the Netherlands, we decided to do some cell um, in vitro experiments where we would remove or deplete or lower the levels of Kaizo in a metastatic breast tumor cell line that we studied in the lab and look to see whether or not reducing the levels of Kaizo would impact the cell proliferation and the cell motility of the cells, two hallmarks that we know are key for tumor genesis. The, the image on the right is showing you the parental version of these cells, MDA231, where the cells are nice and spindly and elongated, which is indicative of a very motile cell type. And then on the right is a, a, um, a clone of that cell where we've removed or reduced the amount of Kaizo in that cell. And I hope you can see the difference in the morphology of these cells. We now have flat cuboidal looking cells, which are more indicative of epithelial cells, which tend to be um, have stable cadherin catenin complexes and are less motile. Next slide, please. So what we did was we took um, these uh, slides, these slides, we took these cells, we took the parental NDA231 cells, and we took the clonal cells of the NDA231 cells, where we have reduced the amount of Kaizo, and we generated, we did this mouse xenograph study. We took one set of mice and injected the mammary fat pad of those mice with the parental NDA231 cells overexpressing a lot of Kaizo and another set of mice where we injected them with the cells expressing very little Kaizo, which I've tried to indicate here by the letter K. So one set of mice got cells with lots of Kaizo expression, one got cells with very little Kaizo expression. We let the cells proliferate in the mice, they form palpable tumors that we could see and feel. And then at a specific time point, we then sacrificed the mice and um, looked at the mice the tissues of the mice to see whether or not the cells that we had injected into the breast of the mice had actually spread to other parts of the mice. Next slide, please. And we were pleasantly and really excited, pleasantly surprised and really happy to find that our hypothesis in this situation was 
correct? Basically, what we found is that the mice that were injected with the parental metastatic cells, shown on the left, two um, images, these cells moved from the breast into the lungs and the liver of the mice that were injected with those cells. And we, we, can, we know this because of the, first of all, the human cells are different. And so it was easy for pathologists to see. And you can see here as well, these dark purple regions that I've outlined in white, those are our human breast tumor cells that have now moved to the lungs and liver and are proliferating in the lungs and liver, which is similar to what happens when um, tumors spread in humans and metastasize our lungs and liver. On the right were, were lungs and liver tissue removed from mice injected with the chyso depleted cells. And I hope you can see the significant difference between the parental cells and the chyso depleted cells. The mice injected with the chyso depleted cells have very, very little and um, metastases, in the, especially in the, in the liver. There are no human cells whatsoever in the liver and a few small metastases in the lung. So this was really exciting and we're continuing the study now. Obviously, there's a lot to follow up on, but this was um, published four years ago, five years ago now, geez. Um, next slide. So as I said, like um, I first heard about this whole triple negative breast cancer um, from Dr. Lisa Newman, who was a breast oncologist collaborating with physicians in West Africa, teaching them breast cancer surgery, et cetera. And so what we now know, among those of us doing health disparities in, in cancer research, especially breast cancer, is that the incidence of triple negative breast cancer across the globe varies by region. In Africa, it ranges from 15% to 80%. So in East Africa, the incidence of triple negative breast cancer is approximately 15 to 20%, relatively low. However, in West Africa, where most um, Black women of the African diaspora are descendants of because of the slave trade, the incidence ranges from 50 to 80% in Ghana and Nigeria. In the Caribbean, it's 14 to 20%, in part because of our genetic admixture. Um, we're not as what we would say um, homogeneously African as our West African um, counterparts. And in North America, as I showed you in pretty earlier slides, the incidence among Black um, women is approximately 20% compared to white women, where it's approximately 10%. Next slide. So as I said, while we were doing all of the molecular biology work in my lab, we also initiated collaborations with researchers and clinicians in Nigeria, Barbados, and Jamaica. Our hypothesis was that this high Kaiso expression in triple negative breast cancer correlated with poor patient survival. Next slide, please. So we made a pilot tissue microarray, and in this, what a pilot tissue what a tissue microarray is, we basically take a very small sample of breast tumor from individual patients, and rather than analyzing one patient at a time, we put that small piece of tumor on a, a wax block with many other pieces of tissues from many other women, which allows us to analyze all the women simultaneously. So it's what we consider a high throughput process. Rather than screening each woman one at a time, we can screen hundreds of women or tens of, of women at one time. So for this pilot microarray, we used 50 Barbadian and 40 Nigerian triple negative breast cancer cases. And then we looked for the expression of Kaizo, BRCA1, and other um, biomarkers. Next slide, please. And this, um, and what we found was that the Kaizo expression correlated significantly with all the amount of African ancestry in our cohort. So the darker the brown, the more expression there is of Kaizo. So the brown staining is indicative of the levels of Kaizo expression in each of these cohorts. In a, like, so I hope you can see that our Nigerian and Barbadian women with triple negative breast cancer had significantly more Kaizo than African American or ca Caucasian women. And because of the time um, allocated for this talk, I don't have time to go into other data that we generated from this study, but basically we found that this high Kaizo expression also correlated with poor patient survival, which is consistent, as I said, with what we saw looking at the TCGA databases. Next slide. So we um, then proceeded to do some, um, uh, to look at whether or not or Black women had any specific mutations or unique mutations that may be contributing to this high um, incidence of triple negative breast cancer. We did a whole genome sequencing um, study where we, I, we took these same tissues that we use in the tissue microarray 
extracted DNA from the tumor regions and then sequenced the DNA to see whether or not there were mutations in any known or, or um, unknown genes that could be contributing to triple negative breast cancer. Next slide. And what we found was that the, um, the genes that were most mutated or altered in our cohort of black women associated with DNA mismatch repair signatures, which is consistent with um, what we the types of, of genes that we know contribute to tumor genesis and poor outcomes. Next slide, please. And we also found um, alterations in specific and well-known oncogenes such as T, um, P53 and MYC. Next slide, please. So some of our ongoing and future studies um, at the moment, there's a lot, but this is just a synopsis, is one of the questions that we keep asking ourselves and many others ask us is what is causing this high level of Kaizo expression in aggressive tumors and cancers? We're also validating the experiments from our pilot TMA, use a larger tissue microarray with over 200 um, TMBC cases from Barbadian and Nigerian cases. And we also have a, uh, we're also making a tissue microarray using a cohort of approximately 150 triple negative breast cancers from Jamaica. Of course, we also want to perhaps um, consider developing Kaizo as a diagnostic or prognostic test um, to see whether or not, well, this would allow us or allow physicians and women to know whether or not they're at, at higher risk of developing triple negative breast cancer and or having uh, metastatic spread to vital organs after diagnosis. And we're further, we're continuing our characterization studies of the genomic profiles of women of African ancestry. And the bottom left corner here, this little, this image I have or icon is an image um, of FIA. This is the logo that we, is character, that we use for our breast cancer education and awareness campaigns in the Caribbean, as well as here in Ontario, when we go out into the community. Next slide. As we know, this is the international decade for people of African descent, and it ends in two years, and not a lot has been done. Next slide. At least not for many of us. And um, so I just wanted to spend the last couple minutes talking about the origins of race as a social construct and how racism impacts um, also permeates, unfortunately, into academia and into healthcare. So we know that um, race is a social construct that was um, developed to judge, classify, and create differences among people based on their physical appearance, skin color, hair texture, and or verbal accents. However, we know there's no biological ev evidence for race, but it's frequently used to discriminate. And it has very immediate and long-term impacts on ind individuals as well as their communities. And sadly, this is perpetuated through media and the stereotypes and various stereotypes, and we all have to work extra hard to combat this. Next slide. So as I said, um, the American Association for Cancer Research has been focused on, or not, I should say has been focused in the past 15 years, they have spent a bit of time and energy focusing on cancer disparities, not just in black people, but recognizing that there are these health disparities, especially in underserved groups. And one theme that's beginning to come out of many of the much of the research that's happening in the U.S. is that racism may be a social determinant of health. And so there's increasing evidence that this trauma from racism, whether it be slavery and centuries of colonization impacts, community violence, racial profiling, the mass incarceration of Black and Indigenous people, and even abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual in our communities or, or in the home. This, there's no evidence to suggest that these kind of traumas actually result in epigenetic changes of our DNA that could be contributing to some of the chronic health challenges that are associated with various communities in the black community, that would be diabetes, heart and stroke, obesity, all these up and uh, et cetera. And um, from the cancer perspective, the studies have also revealed that African-American women, men and women, have 111% higher risk of dying from um, prostate cancer and breast cancer compared to white Americans. So this is problematic. And at least, um, at least in the US, they're aware of this. Sadly, in Canada, we do not collect race-based data. So most of my research has been reliant on data from the US actually, because we just don't collect this data in Canada. There's now a push to collect this data. 
We're all excited about the recent federal budget that's allocating funds specifically for Black researchers in Canada. And so we're hoping that we can move the dial and really make some headway in collecting um, ethnicity-based data and health outcomes data in Canada. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a synopsis of what I just said. Next slide. And we can, okay, well, so this, um, so this is um, a, what I guess what I consider the business case for an anti-racism framework in cancer care, but also in healthcare in general. The classic Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm. And believe it or not, there's a revised Hippocratic Oath, which is to eliminate our personal biases, combat disinformation, so that we can improve health literacy and be an ally to minorities and other underserved groups in society. Because ultimately, racism costs more for us to address, or it costs more for society to address the consequences of race, racism. In the case of cancer, we have late stage diagnosis of cancers because many people in Black and Indigenous and South Asian communities do not trust the healthcare system, especially because there's low or no representation of healthcare workers who look like us. And in the case of the Black community, because of um, what happened with the Tuskegee syphilis trial, the Henry Adelax, and we can go on and on. We saw recently how this mistrust of the healthcare system further exacerbated the health and economic disparities in underserved communities. Those communities did not trust the healthcare system, so there was lots of vaccine hesitancy, and consequently, many of them um, um, con contracted COVID, many of them died, and then up some of them and then those that lived were unable to work. It just had this horrible ripple effect, basically because of this lack of trust of the healthcare system. And ultimately as an employer, we then have employee loss wages and short and long-term disability costs um, as a result of this racism. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the studies that I'm also engaged in is this collaboration with Dr. Ingrid Waldron, Paulo Marignani, and Ms. Louise Delisle. And this is a project that we're conducting in Halifax, in, in Halifax, in a small African Nova Scotian community of Shelburne. And this was a case where one of the residents, Ms. Louise Delisle, reached out to us and Dr. Waldron specifically, because she was noticing the significant proportion of residents of her community having lots of cancer. And it just wasn't making sense to her that she knew so many people with cancer. And so we were funded last year to conduct this study and we'll be testing, collecting and testing biospecimens from the black residents of this community to see whether or not they've been exposed to um, unusually high levels of toxic chemicals or heavy metals because there's a biohazardous um, dump and waste site that was built close to this community. And so part of Louise's hypothesis is that this is contributing to their high cancer incidence, which is higher than the global, um, the Canadian um, percentage for, for a community of this size. And so we'll also be looking, sequencing their genomes to see whether they have any unique mutations that might be contributing to this incredibly high cancer incidence of all types. They, they have breast, lung, colon, prostate, brain. It, it's actually quite disturbing. Next slide, please. So I'm wrapping up now. Um, yep. Yeah, so the barriers are real, and um, this I um, my colleague Dr. Median Andrade first showed this slide, and and I've um, been showing it as well recently in my talks. And I'm going to get my own version of this made to add a few others to this to these barriers. And for me personally, um, especially the last five years, trying to do this research on triple negative breast cancer focusing on black women has not been without many, many challenges. The first time we tried to get funded to do this project in 2013, one of the reviewers said that um, a study looking at breast cancers in black women was not relevant to the Canadian context, which blew me and my researcher and trainees completely away. Like all my, we were like in complete shock that a, a, a reviewer would say that. And then more recently, uh, about two years ago, a reviewer wrote, why should we study Kaizo in Black women? Or the applicant should study Kaizo in Black women. And literally, these were the only two comments from the reviewer, and this sunk my grant. The other two reviewers gave me stellar scores, fantastic reviews, 
and this reviewer gave me a score that sunk my grant application. And currently there's no accountability for poor or discriminatory reviews. So I challenged this particular review because both of these questions, the first question was kind of racist. And then the second question basically was telling me that as the applicant, I should study Kaizo in black women, but that's what my entire grant proposal was about. So this reviewer clearly did not do did not do a good job reviewing the grant and should not be reviewing grants ever again. Next slide, please. So what can you do? Um, all of us should be engaging in transformative work with Black and Indigenous researchers and clinicians. Um, many of us Black and Indigenous scientists and clinicians are stretched super thin. We're being consulted to fix a situation that we did not create. And I mean, it's great that there's all this attention to EDI and, and to building an inclusive community and having inclusive excellence, but there are so few of us that manage to, you know, pass through the pipeline to get to where we are, that we're being called upon a lot to, to do um, talks like this. And, and I love this opportunity, don't get me wrong, but it's just that there, there is sometimes very little recognition of, of the extra burden that's put on, on the few that have made it through the system. Um, be an ally, acknowledge our own privilege. All of us have privilege, including me. I have privilege compared to other um, black people in the community or even, even black other black scientists. So we all need to acknowledge our own privilege. It's not, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. And we should all be engaging in anti-racist activities. Next slide, please. This is the wrong presentation. Next slide. <laughs> I, I think we we uploaded the wrong one just now for this talk. Anyway, that's okay. Um, so what can you do? Representation with agency matters. And this is also something that I am really um, advocating for at McMaster and in all Canadian universities and organizations is having the token Black or Indigenous or South Asian person is, is not going to cut it anymore. If someone's on a committee or in a position of leadership, they have to have the agency to make decisions and their, their voices need to be heard and valued and accepted as experts in whatever they're saying. Next slide, please. And black excellence, we belong. This is a photo of one of my recent, my recent PhD um, graduate, Sean Hercules, and a photo of my, some, um, a summer party, one of my, some of my team a few years ago, my lab has been very diverse not through my <laughs> making, but because one of the only, I thought we were saying one of the only, as the only black female scientist at McMaster for 22 years, the students find me. And so my lab tends to be very diverse as a result of that. Next slide, please. And I just want to end by acknowledging all the folks that I collaborate with and the funding agencies that have supported our work. Next slide. And I will end there and thank you and take any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Daniels, for that presentation. Yeah, we uploaded the old presentation and not the new one. I'm so sorry about that, all of the technical issues. Okay. But it was honestly, it was extremely interesting because going to McMaster, I've heard of your work, but I never really got a chance to like delve deep into Kaizo. And I think that's extremely interesting that the fact that you could, uh, it correlates with the incidents and the mortality rates and even just the amount of having the amount of Kaizo within the cells can really determine the outcomes, which is like a pretty amazing finding for that so and i haven't and I didn't see again because of the time i didn't even but there's also this this health disparity or this disparity in outcomes for breast cancer also occurs in prostate cancer so black mm -hmm. men with prostate cancer also express high levels of high zone compared to white men diagnosed with prostate cancer so we're really excited i guess that there's this correlation linking Kaizo to health disparities. So it's something that we want to pursue and see if we could, as I said, develop it as a prognostic or diagnostic marker for tumor aggressiveness of all types in, in black populations. Yeah, that's interesting that it can go to different types of cancers as well, that you're able to turn that. So I guess um, yeah. just with 
being able to figure out um, with other different types of cancers, um, not just the two that you've studied, that there's potential for that. And being able to get tumor samples, like um, fresh tumor samples and patient samples from women in uh, the diaspora, women in the, on the continent, women in the Caribbean is pretty amazing because that's rarely done. So yeah, and I just and I meant to like I meant to put it in the like might have been in the up the recent slides, but anyway, but I was like, oh yeah, this is an immunology talk. I should throw in something about inflammation or something, because <laughs> but I didn't get to say that. But for those of you that are like, there's this is an immunology talk series. So Kaizo <laughs> is also Kaizo high Kaizo expression also contributes to inflammation, and inflammation is known to play a role in cancer development. So there's that whole other side of our research that we're now digging into, where we're looking at Kaizo's role in inflammatory responses and what, how that contributes to cancer development. So yeah. So I have a question from um, Ade Peju. Uh, she wanted to know, what is Kaizo's expression like in healthy participants? It's low. The level is quite low. So the normal level of Kaizo expression is is low. It's okay. so the what we would call the homeostatic expression level is a low level of expression. Yeah. So it seems like there's some sort of threshold in terms of um, exactly. Kaizo expression and exactly. how it goes. Exactly. Um, for the um, so I also have a question from Eduardo, and um, he wanted to know if Kaiso has a significant effect on the prognosis of other cancers. So you touched in a little bit on that. But. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So at the, so there's several studies. I mean, studying two cancers is a lot. Like, so in my lab, we study breast and colon cancer, and that's all, more than enough to keep me busy. Um, but other labs are studying Kaiso now as well, and they've found that high Kaiso expression is correlating with poor prognosis in pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, as I said, prostate cancer. So there is a correlation with the Kaiso expression levels and poor outcomes in other cancers, not just breast. So but that also, so just more of a personal question, what is your favorite part about being a cancer researcher? Um, I guess my favorite part is the Curie, like I'm, I, I love problem solving. I'm one of those that loves puzzles. And so I think I got into research because of that. It's like a problem to be solved. And as I said, you know, losing my, my neighbor and my mom at a, at a young age, when I was a young age, you know, I don't want other young people to have to go through that because it was quite traumatic for me and my brother and my entire extended family, of course. And so that's part of my motivation. And so for me, the, I get excited when we make a discovery and we can connect like the dot from over here or this part of the puzzle to this part of the puzzle. And we begin to get a sense of what the puzzle is going to look like. So unlike the most puzzles where you have a picture and you're trying to put the pieces together to look like the picture, we have no idea what the picture is going to be, but we're finding pieces that go together and the picture is beginning to take shape, if that makes sense. So that's when I get excited when like, all these bits and pieces of information that we have start to coalesce and come together to form an image. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then yeah, I feel I like, Hey, we're close to a discovery. We're close to a, a cure or something or treatment. Yeah. Like you're right on the frontier. And yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. So and with that, like you can see your passion for your research and research in general and in black women. And um, so there's another question on, so what advice did you have for future scientists who wanted to be involved with research in an area similar to yours, where there's typically lack of support? Well, I have three job openings in my lab. So if they want to come to Canada or work in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one, that's one piece of advice. Just send me a note. Um, I literally have three positions that I need to fill like three months ago. I just haven't had time to post the jobs or to interview people. Um, so um, I would say, like, for me, my motivation is unique because I had two people that died when I was quite young. So I literally had blinders on, I think, where it's like, I am going to do this. And so, you know, maybe people were being racist to me and sexist to me when I was a student and a postdoc, but I didn't notice. As I said, that first really overt situation was when I was, you know, in my late 20s. And, you know, maybe I've been experienced, maybe people were being racist before that, but I never noticed it because I think I was so focused on achieving my goal. And I do recognize as well the difference growing up in the Caribbean where you're surrounded by 
black lawyers, black dentists, black physicians, black politicians, like you're surrounded by black excellence in every single profession. And so I wasn't brought up in a culture thinking about race. I was definitely thinking about classism and social economic status, but not race. And I think the big difference in North America, Canada and the US is there's this cloud of racism that weighs you down and it distracts you from focusing on what you want to do. So I think that advice would be to surround yourself with as many ambitious black people as possible that are authentic as well. You need authentic people <laughs> in your life and, and you know, have them as your, your support for those days when you, you just need to be encouraged to keep your eye on the prize. Yeah, and in line with that too, when you were going through your, um, like the review process for different grants and um, trying to secure some funding, um, well, I guess aside from the poor reviews, what is the overall landscape or the overall research landscape for uh, triple negative breast cancer in black women? How does that research look like? Um, so in the US, there is a lot, as I said, the interesting, the irony of the US with all of its you know, foibles and racism is there, there is dedicated funding for um, research in black communities, whether it's triple negative breast cancer or any health disparity research, you can actually apply for funding to do that. In, the, in Canada, up until this budget last week, there was no de designated funding for research on black communities by black researchers and for black students. So the landscape, I would say, for the next couple of years, at least while our current government is in power, is pretty good because there's been funds set aside for this type of research. Um, but it's all dependent on who's in power, unfortunately. So that question from was uh, was from Medina. So another part to that question is, so not necessarily, I guess, government funding, but is there a lot of interest from, let's say, industry folks or people in yep. academia? Some or industries is... have, have now started getting interested. Surprisingly, the interest only started in the last couple of years because they're hearing about these disparities. And many of them are also responding to equity diversity initiatives, and they want to do something to address the disparities and the systemic racism and barriers that many of us have been shouting about for decades. And so many companies are now beginning to see the value of this type of research. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's extremely important. Just going from it, going from that reviewer comment to being like, oh, this is not important here in Canada to now getting some recognition, getting some funding to actually push this research forward because a lot of black women, Latino women are, are dying and they have yeah. such incidents yeah. or high mortality rates for something yeah. that we could potentially like at least break down a bit. So and with that- just um, up, Yeah, so I just wanna follow yeah, up no, as well. Like, I should have, like then when you said that, I was like, I should mention like the first grass I said in 2013 when it was like, this is a relevant to Canadian context and what advice to give scientists that want to do this, despite barriers or whatever without support, is as I said, be completely focused if that's your goal. Because as I said, I was determined to do this. And I got, I literally applied to that particular agency three times. The first time was, this is a relevant Canadian context. The next time they were picky about something else. But I knew that I was doing and proposing something that was unique to Canada. No one else in Canada was doing it at the time. And in fact, no one else in the US was doing it either. In the US, they were collecting epidemiological data. They were not looking at the genetic aspect of triple negative breast cancer. So we were proposing something completely novel. And I knew that and I was committed and determined. And so I went from the, this isn't relevant to the Canadian context the first time to being funded the third time and being ranked number one on that, in that group of applications. And the same with that grant where the reviewer said, oh, you should study Kaizo. Why should you study it in black women? Same thing. That was like my third or fourth rejection for the project from the Canadian agency. And I was persistent because I knew I was doing, I was proposing something novel. No one else in Canada was doing it and it needed to be done. And same thing. It got funded last year and was ranked number one on the panel. 
I actually had to enlarge the email to make sure that it wasn't number seven because I couldn't believe that I was number one. <laughs> so right. I just simply remember saying, is that a one or a seven? And I blew up the email, you know, it's like, oh my God, I'm number one. So, you know, going from rejection to like a horrible rejection to number one was quite, yeah, yeah, it was cool. So, yeah, it's just, so I feel it's not like being determined and being convinced inside that this is what you should be doing and it's what needs to be done despite the rejection like eventually lots of sweat and tears <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah it's just a testament to your hard work so and with that i think we're going to wrap up the session i just want to first of all like thank you so much again for being part of our first change maker series our first guest on the awesome. change maker series we've learned a lot um, just from your research, from your advocacy, from your passion, um, just changing the landscape of triple negative breast cancer. So we really appreciate it. Um, we like to thank the audience. We like to thank everybody for um, joining in today, um, from learning from Dr. Daniel and hearing her speak. And if you had any other questions, you can um, let us know in Black and Amino, and we can um, speak with Dr. Daniel further. And um, we're planning on doing a little bit more of these series, so you're welcome to join, but you can always follow up with us on Black and Amino. So yeah, once again- in, We're not doing hop in anymore, right? We're not gonna do the breakout rooms or whatever? No, no I think it was just easier to stay here and get the questions that way. Too much technology. Yeah, yeah, with our, our hiccups this morning or then the beginning, so yeah. <laughs> But thank you so much again, Dr. Daniel, for doing this. You're we welcome. Really appreciate thank it. you for inviting thank you so me. Much. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you so you. much for inviting me. And thank you to everyone who spent the past hour listening in. And I hope it was informative and educational and, you know, motivates some people to get up and go. And yeah, let's, let's do this. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.